Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon and uh, all of you here in person and those of you online um, uh, to our session on making sense of the midterms, um, a conversation with Caitlin Kim. Uh, delighted that you could join us. Um, certainly a fascinating, um, perhaps somewhat surprising evening last night, uh, but still more drama to come as, as apparently is our pattern in the US, we don't decide things on election night. <laughs> We have a, a long, uh, a, a long uh, post-election drama. Um, certainly uh, more of a red ripple than a tsunami that many had expected based on the historic patterns of, uh, of uh, midterms uh, going against the party in power and because of inflation and crime concerns. But uh, there's certainly many things still to be decided, still hanging in the balance in the U.S. Senate where... Uh, uh, we may come down to a runoff between Herschel Walker and, and uh, Raphael Warnock in Georgia. And, and certainly here in Colorado, fascinating, there's almost a blue wave here in Colorado. Um, the statewide sweep of Democrats by large margins um, and still some uncertainty, some perhaps sur surprisingly so, uh, in the third district with Lauren Boebert and then the new eighth district. Um, where Yadira Carvalho is uh, is actually still has, a, 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 I think, a, a slim lead. Anyway, I'm Fritz Mayer. I'm the dean of the Corbell School. Delighted to welcome all of you and um, and to welcome our, our, our two conversationalists uh, today here to, to, to help us make sense of things. Uh, first is Caitlin Kim, who is, um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, the public affairs reporter for Colorado Public Radio. Um, she is a very respected, experienced, and deeply knowledgeable journalist uh, with considerable experience covering elections, and not just in Colorado, but but around the country. I suspect many of you heard her this morning on your commute in uh, on Colorado Public Radio. And joining her in conversation uh, is DU's own Professor Seth Maskett, Director of the Center on American Politics here at the Corbell School. Seth, Seth is the author of several books on American politics, numerous articles, and is a regular contributor to 530.org uh, uh, and the uh, Denver Post and, and, and other outlets uh, as well. I believe you got, uh, when you registered, you, you, you got cards, uh, you walked in. Uh, those are for you to write questions on. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation with those of you here in the, in the audience. So if you'll write your questions on the cards, we'll collect them and then we'll try to get to as many of those as, as we can. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Caitlin and Seth. Hi, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Dean Fritz Mayer, for that lovely introduction um, and for hosting this event today. Um, good to see so many of you here, including some of you who may have even been here last night and never left this room as we were watching the election returns come in. Obviously, we still have um, lots more to learn. The quick lessons, as, um, you know, as Fritz was suggesting, um, the trends seem to be that uh, you know, Republicans did um, had a good night, but not a great one. Um, they seem on track to pick up the House of Representatives. The Senate is still very much in doubt. Um, it, there's a pretty good chance it'll end up with a 50-50 Senate again, but we, we'll, we'll know more soon. Um, I'm hoping we can, uh, I want to talk about a range of things here um, with our distinguished guest, Caitlin. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about what's, what we saw here in the state of Colorado, what we saw nationally, um, but I'd actually love to start off with a question about what you've been doing over the last few months here. You've been racing all over the state, putting I don't know how many miles on your car, um, interviewing a lot of Coloradans about their, their decisions and the votes they're making. And I would actually love to hear your impression about, like, what have you learned from these interviews? Um, they've been great interviews, by the way. I've really enjoyed listening to them. But, like, what, what do you pick up from these that we might miss from polls, from election results? What, what do you get from those? Well, first of all, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm very sorry if I'm a little bit, I don't know, if I get a little spacey. I had a late night, so I'm just warning you all ahead of time. Um, so I am the Washington DC reporter for Colorado Public Radio, so I'm usually back in DC. So every time I come to Colorado, what I like to do is get a rental car or the CPR news vehicle and sort of go out on the road and talk to people, talk to Coloradans, because that's the best way I'm going to find out what people are thinking, what they want from federal government, 
what they want from their congressperson or anyone running for office in general. Um, and in talking to them, you know, first of all, you find out the issues that are most important to them. So one of the things when the the House that, you know, Democrats are talking about their whole entire Build Back Better package and all the things they were talking about, I would, you know, reach out to people in Colorado and be like, are these your concerns? And frankly, usually it wasn't. It was things like price of gas, price of milk and eggs. It was all the cost of living stuff that has been a problem, I think, for the last year or so. So, you know, it told me that maybe Democrats weren't focusing on the issues that they needed to be focusing on. And, you know, it, it also helps by, you know, talking to people like you all across the state. It also helps me sort of hone the questions I want to ask, you know, the Colorado representatives back in D.C. You know, you keep talking about X, Y, Z. I'm not, you know, whether it be restricting abortion access or, you know, TikTok on 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 um, on a government phone or, you know, the child tax credit, whatever it is that any sort of member of Congress is talking about from Colorado, I could be like, you know, actually, this isn't what I heard from members there, um, from the people back home. I would also say the other thing that I, I get that doesn't always sort of translate is you get the sense of enthusiasm. How excited are you about a race? How excited are you about candidates? So Joe O'Day, I think, is a good example. Like, he got a lot of national attention for being sort of, you know, a different type of Republican Senate candidate, right? Like more moderate, broke with Trump, um, you know, uh, more moderate, broke with Trump. Uh, pro choice. Pro, well, Side that's, that's the, the more moderate okay. thing, right? So, <laughs> but, you know, um, and got a lot of national attention. But when you talk to people about voter, like about Joe O'Day, they'd be like, yeah, I'm going to vote for him. Why? He's the Republican candidate, right? And what's the other option? Whereas someone like Lauren Boebert, when you go out to that district and you find her supporters, they are enthusiastic about her. You know, they love her spunk, you know, they call her a firecracker, whatever it is. They like that she stands up for the values that they believe in. And you can sense that enthusiasm. And that is not something you always get from polls. So this, this is one of the reasons I like to go out and actually talk to people. Now, all that being said, people don't always want to talk to you about politics. It's become really hard to talk about politics these days and difficult and like it just, some people just don't want to. So as a reporter, my fear is always that I'm missing some sort of undercurrent, you know, people who just don't feel like talking about it, but also feel passionately about something, an issue, a candidate that doesn't, you know, translate. So my fear for most of this election, which was probably the wrong fear, I should have been fearing the CD3 race, was the Senate race. I kept f feeling like I was missing this sort of you know, some undercurrent of support for Joe Day, just given the economic sort of headwinds Democrats are facing all across the country, including in Colorado, and that probably that didn't really manifest itself. Thanks. Um, OK, <laughs> sorry. So long winded no, question. That's good. Uh, so you brought up Colorado races and I actually love to dig into that. Um, so one of the big stories here from last night um, uh, within Colorado, Democrats had a very good night, right? Um, and, in some ways, many, you know, better than many expected. Um, Polis, by the last polls I saw, is ahead by something like 17 points now. Um, Michael Bennett is up by like 12 or 13. Um, basically, the Democrats are like cleaning up in all the statewide races. And currently, you know, Frisch in the third is, is, is beating Boebert, not by much, by a few thousand votes, and they haven't tabulated them all yet, but Boebert is at the present losing. Um, also, Caraveo is currently ahead in the 8th District, but again, very narrowly. These could go either way, but um, one of the stories from earlier this year uh, was that Colorado Republicans did what most Republicans in other states didn't do. That is, they mostly nominated pretty moderate candidates. They got nominated people like O'Day um, and, and some other candidates, um, uh, Pamela Anderson um, running uh, in, for Secretary of State and others who... Uh, and it's not clear what they got from that. Like those people still lost by very large margins. And so was that a smart move? Um, was, was it worth the effort? Um, you know, I'm curious what, what lesson they should be drawing from that. Uh, that's a good question. And this is, the, I think, the question that members of the Republican Party in Colorado are going to be asking themselves seriously, I think, over the next four years. I do think this was probably the best slate of Republican candidates they could have gotten, right? Everybody was moderate, none of the election deniers. Um, I think there are two issues there. First one is, where does the Republican Party go from here? I think 
if you can't elect someone on that slate with this economic condi- like the economic headwinds that the nation is facing right now, it does sort of say, to me, it indicates that Colorado has changed. That like Colorado is probably more blue than than people might want to recognize in the state because it, 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 I think they're very proud of you guys are all very proud of your purplish um, roots, but you know, all all the like the hardcore right people also. If, if that slate had come up, I think those numbers would have been even higher. I, I mean, I don't see how any of those candidates do as well statewide either. So I think this is the big question. I think this is sort of the the come to Jesus moment for the Republican Party. What can they do in the next four years? They've got four years to kind of regroup and, and try and figure out where to go from here. And is there a path forward? I mean, has the demographic of Colorado changed such that, you know, this is going to be a blue state, a solidly blue state, you know, for the foreseeable cycles, you know, until there's another sort of realignment, whatever that might be. Um, and this is one of the big questions, I think, coming up. <laughs> and we'd love to hear your thoughts about this, especially if there are any Republicans out there. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just, this is really fascinating. I was discussing in my class this morning that like, if you were to go back, not even 10 years ago, Florida and Colorado were both considered very swingy states that could have gone either way in an, an election. And they have both diverged very rapidly in different directions um, with uh, Polis essentially becoming like the anti DeSantis or something like that. Like he's, he's gone, he's winning as big democratic as DeSantis is winning Republican. Um, man, could that be a future presidential matchup? Do you think, do you, do you see like a future for these characters or? I mean, definitely for DeSantis. <laughs> okay. if, um, so Ryan Warner, who hosts Colorado Matter and hosts our uh, election night coverage actually asked uh, Governor Polis about this question about, you know, presidential thing. And like any deaf politician, he basically talked about how much he loves his current job. So <laughs> we shall see. Um, but I mean, I do think there is always, it goes to it goes back to the question of what makes the best presidential candidate is it someone who's already had executive experience which are governors they know what it's like to run and and you know work with a legislature that may or may not be all all the same party or might be split government or do you get someone from the senate or the house you know or a businessman someone outside uh who has never had executive sort of experience before um and I, I can't answer that question. I, you know, I think those two names are going to be like definitely DeSantis's name is going to be bandied about. I don't know if anybody, any of you saw the New York Post um, uh, the cover page. It said the future. Uh-huh. So, you know, where where they're going with that one. So probably much to <laughs> Trump's annoyance. But um, I, I do think, you know, Polis's Polis's name is going to be thrown around. He did really well. He got good coverage for the way the state handled COVID. You know, he, you know, I, I know that there are some people who complain that he kept things shut for too long, but I'm on the East Coast. You guys opened up a lot earlier than we did on the East Coast. So I, I don't know that he gets that kind of credit. Mm-hmm. Usually I would ask you that question, but um, I expect we'll hear his name being bandied about as a Democratic uh, possibility for the foreseeable future until we know for sure what I think Biden's going to do. I also wanted to ask, you had mentioned um, uh, Bobert before, and that it was, it's easy to pick up when you're out um, on the Western Slope, her enthusiastic supporters and how much, you know, how much enthusiasm they had for her. Did you see this coming? Like, I'm curious, did you, were you picking up a, a, a sort of anti bobert vote or there was some sort of fresh mentum out there that uh, others of us weren't seeing or? That's nice, I might okay. steal that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so here's the thing about Bobert: People either love her or they hate her especially out in the West, like nobody's like, who's Boebert? You know, I, I'm like, I'm agnostic about her. That is not something that happens with Lauren Boebert. So you do, you do pick up on an anti Boebert sentiment. Um, people are not shy about giving you their opinion, pro or con about her. Did I pick up on this? I'm going to say no, mainly because there, there are actually a few reasons. One, Redistricting made this a, a redder district. It has a 0.9 Republican lean, right? She should be safe, given that. I mean, the, the big question is always, the largest block is unaffiliated voters. How will they break? But she also beat Don Quorum in the Republican primary very soundly. It was like 65, 35. It was, she beat him. There was no question about that. And you had heard this like momentum beforehand 
about, you know, all these Democrats who were becoming unaffiliated so they could vote in the Republican primary and try and knock her out there because that was going to be the easiest way to do it or the easiest place to do it. So, you know, I've heard this and even in, you know, if you can remember way back to 2020 where people thought she could be beatable then, right? Like, so there has been this narrative of Lauren Boebert being beatable. But again, all that in mind, she's an incumbent. She's an incumbent who is a prolific fundraiser. She raised over $6 million this cycle. That is a lot of money for a Colorado congressperson. Not a senator, a member of the House. I think like Doug Lamborn maybe got like 100000 so that just tells you, or maybe, all right, I'm, I'm exaggerating. He probably got more like 400,000, but it just, it just tells you the gap, right? Um, and then she's got national name recognition. Again, people know who she is. I'm sure all your friends out of state ask you about Lauren Boebert, right? Yeah, so I think those are very powerful things. She has like over 1.7 million followers on Twitter. She has, you know, she has a soapbox from which she can speak and, you know, I feel like I've gotten away from your question, but yeah. I didn't pick up on it yeah. mainly because I thought she had all these advantages going into the race, especially the plus nine. Now, I still think there are a lot of ballots out there that need to be counted and the gap is small enough that like, you know, I don't think Democrats are celebrating at all right now. I think this is still something, in my opinion, it's still her race to lose just given the demographics of that district, but I was very surprised and I will just leave it at that. Very, very surprised. And I, I will also add, I did ask around because I think I actually even called you about this. I called a couple people about this race because I had heard rumblings that it would be closer than you would anticipate, but I just didn't think it'd be this close. I think I very confidently predicted she would easily sail to reelection. And yeah, yeah that's, that's holding up pretty well right now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I didn't see this coming either. I think very few people did. And, you know, for her to be underperforming like this, even if she ends up winning, to be underperforming in I guess what's like, you know, a district that I guess Biden lost by like nine points um, as an incumbent after doing, you know, much better than this two years ago, um, it's kind of striking um, for, you know, particularly given how many, how much people kind of vote on party line that she actually, she is alienating some people who would normally be in her corner. I will also add though, like this, this is where, the difference between 2020 and 2022. Mm -hmm. 2020, she didn't have a record. 2022, she does. She's voted against a lot of things that, you know, the majority of Republicans did vote for, right? Like, you know, oh God, uh, there was like the leukemia. Uh, there, there are a bunch of like nonpartisan, like common sense things that she didn't vote, she didn't vote for. You know, she would use an argument like, I didn't like the process, you know, they didn't allow amendments whatever, but she still voted against it. And I think Adam Frisch has been very good about using those votes against her, including like a lot of votes against veterans, um, you know, healthcare, whatnot, you know, public lands bills, which are also very big in Colorado. And I don't think that helped. I think, you know, the Western Slope has had a history of representatives who are responsive and, you know, listen to their constituents, might not always agree, but will listen to them. Lauren Boebert, from the people that I've talked to, hasn't developed that kind of reputation within the district. And I think that has her, her. Interesting, okay. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, some of the lessons that Republicans within Colorado are taking um, from this lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious, like na uh, nationally, um, particularly like the story, like what, what Trump should be taking from this, what Republicans should be thinking from Trump. One of the stories from here, and I, I think there was some story on, foxnews.com this morning about how a number of Republicans are saying he was the problem here, that he was very active in a number of primary elections. He steered them toward some underperforming Senate nominees, um, and maybe it's time to move on from him. Now, we'll see how long that narrative lasts, but um, I'm, I'm kind of curious what your take. Does this, does this election kind of hurt him? Because he, did he overpromise? Uh, what, what do you think here? I feel like this is a narrative we hear a lot about yeah. Donald Trump. <laughs> over and over and over again. We heard this, I think, post January 6th. We've heard this after 2018. We hear this a lot. I will believe it when I see it. Um, I don't think you should count Donald Trump out. I mean, his base is very loyal. Um, and I have heard, you know, talking with Colorado, uh, Colorado Republicans, especially I think 
you know, conservative to moderate who, who have said they'd rather see like a DeSantis or a Nikki Haley or a Tim Scott, you know, Josh Hawley, anyone but Trump run. Um, whether or not that happens, I don't know. I think we're gonna have to see. I think if, if Trump gets knocked out, he gets knocked out in a primary. He, he doesn't sort of go gracefully into that good night. I just, I just don't see it. I, I, he, he's, had, he's had plenty of opportunities to do that and he's never taken it. That said, you can always be wrong. <laughs> He's and I am, I am, he surprised us before <laughs> 2016 being a prime example, but, um, I, I would not be surprised, frankly, with anything that Donald Trump does. Yeah. Okay. Fair. <laughs> um, I want to actually turn to, um, one of the national stories over the last several months has been, uh, of course, abortion, um, particularly since the Dobbs decision, um, earlier this year. And, uh, Last night, there were, I think, five states that had abortion measures on the ballot uh, about constitutional amendments. Um, California, Vermont, and Michigan passed constitutional amendments to enshrine the pro-life position in the, in the state constitution. I think uh, it was Kentucky and Montana that um, had anti-choice measures that failed. Um, and I saw some analysis suggesting that those the pro-choice position actually outperformed uh, Democratic candidates in those states. So like it was it's obviously an important issue for Democrats, but it also goes beyond just the Democratic Party. And I'm wondering, like, we've been sort of torn watching that issue over the year where like at first it seemed like it was being it was a massive stimulus to uh, Democratic turnout. Democrats wanted to change things back. Then it seemed to be fading. Is the story that it was still a big driver event? Is it part of the reason that Democrats did well beat expectations last night? Um, yes, I think that's the, the short answer. Um, I think. Even I was surprised how often uh, abortion rights came up when I was talking to voters in Colorado, just because Colorado has codified those that, you know, protections in the state. So I figured, it, you know, if you live here, you're probably not too worried about it. A lot of people that I talked to, a lot of voters were worried about it. Um, and, and, you know, again, that kind of surprised me. It was one of the things you learn when you talk to people. And I think if the if, you know, if Democrats do do well, or at least like exceed expectations when it comes to control of the Senate, and the house which i still think is a stretch but i think you know that fact that it wasn't sort of a red wave year i think part of it is because of dobbs you know this is the case of what the the dog that caught up with a car and republicans have been talking about this for years now that they have it you know it, it was something that, that was used to like motivate their base and you know now you don't have that and you're really seeing i think the public even people who don't necessarily agree with abortion, not wanting to see something that had been available to them for the last 50 years taken away. I think it's always this idea of you have a right when and it when you when government gets rid of it, that's when you see people sort of get mad and take action and, and vote. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Do you so, disagree? Yeah, no, I totally, <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. But it's been, it's honestly, been, it's been difficult to measure that. I think it's been difficult to know. I mean, you go through the issues and get a sense of what people are feeling, and and you know, there's, I, I get questions from from students and from relatives and from others saying, don't people care about uh, democracy or election deniers, and don't they care about environment? And like, yes, they care, but like. Inflation is staring them in the face every day. Um, abortion is something on the you know front forefront of a lot of people's minds, like in a, just in a very visceral way, um, in a way that others might not be. So it was, you never really know until it happens what people are actually going to vote on. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I was sort of struck by last night, and I might be wrong on this, is, is kind of a dog that didn't bark story. Um, uh, election deniers. Um, there were a lot of election deniers running. Some of them have won, um, and some of them are in sensitive positions that could affect 2024. Some of them have lost and conceded quietly and went home. Um, and I, I kind of wasn't expecting that as much. Now, we're, we're maybe getting a little of that from Kerry Lake in Arizona. I don't know yet. Um, but what, what's your impression on that? Is that is that turned out to be less of a story than we might have expected for 2022? So I'm going to be honest. I haven't really been following that one as much. and. When I look at the election deniers, I've been looking at sort of the ones that are in Congress, right? The Congress members, they're getting reelected or elected because um, there are a lot, you know, there, you know, Warren Boebert voted against certification, Doug Lamborn voted against certification. 
Doug Lamborn sailed to re-election. We'll see what happens with Lauren Boebert. I'm not, but I'm not sure that you know her vote against certification is what's turning people against her. Just one of many things. Um, on the one hand, I am very glad to see that happen because, you know, for we've heard this drumbeat about how, you know, there has been fraud or our elections aren't secure without any proof. And at a certain point, you have to prove it. And the fact that it's gone on as long as it has, I don't, I, you know, I think our institutions have always been fairly strong. And, you know, on one hand, people will say, it's, you know, our institutions have withstood it, but it's, you know, there are cracks in the foundation. And I, I worry about what happens to those cracks. Mm -hmm. Do they get patched? Do they not? Are we, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say that it's, you know, the end of democracy. I don't believe that either. Um, but, you know, like anything, democracy has to be nurtured and fed and, and strengthened from both within and outside. And I, I kind of, wonder when you have a lot of members of Congress who are willing to sort of wink and nod to, to it and to, you know, to, to satisfy someone else or to satisfy their base without actually saying, you know, there wasn't any fraud or, you know, this is why our election systems are secure. I wonder how much of a beating the institutions can take. And I'll just, there you go. I'll leave it at that. Um. I'd love to ask your, you have to prognosticate a little bit about the future here. So assuming, um, there's some assumptions built in here, but um, assuming we end up with a, uh, a Republican House, um, one with a fairly narrow Republican majority, um, you know, five to 10 seats, um, what does that look like over the next two years? What, what should we expect from them? Um, is, it, is there a policy agenda there? Is this all about investigating and impeaching Biden? Um, you know, what, 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 what does this look like? Yes, Okay. yes and yes. So the policy agenda will be their commitment to America, which is what McCarthy and House Republicans rolled out earlier this year. I mean, it's, it, there's not a lot to it. There's not really like a lot of nuance, like policy detail in it, but, you know, strengthening the border, it, it's the things you would expect, right? Strengthening the border, protecting life, um, you know, backing police officers, et cetera, um, military. How much of that they get through though? The conventional wisdom is that the narrower Kevin McCarthy, who is still most likely gonna be the Speaker of the House, the narrower a majority he has, the less, mo less room he has to maneuver. Um, so aside from like getting your policy agenda through, especially one when you have a divided government, like, you know, House Republicans may talk about defunding or not making making sure that there's no they're not they're not 87,000 IRS agents. Getting the Senate and Biden to agree with that two totally different things. Biden this is Biden's bill, right? He can easily veto it. And how many votes does it take to override a veto in both chambers? Come on, say it. Two thirds. You're not going to get two thirds in the House to do that. You would need Repub you need Democratic support. Um, so there are going to be limits to how much House Republican, how far the House Republican agenda can go. Um, but they also do have to govern. If Republicans are in control of the House, they are going to also be responsible for making sure the lights of government are turned on, making sure we don't go over a fiscal cliff with the debt ceiling. You know, yes, will they, will they try and negotiate changes? Yes. But I would say, you know, and I would hope most, most people here agree, ruining the credit rating of the United States is not the way to do it. Right, it's it just makes everything more expensive, and the government shutdown. You know, for all for all that people complain about government, once government is shut down and you're not getting your social security check or your Medicare or your the national parks are closed, or it going through airports takes so much longer because TSA is scaled back, it it impacts your day to day life. You may not know it or recognize it, but it does, and you need government sometimes. You might not like it, but you need it, and they're going to be responsible for making sure the bills get paid and people are going to work. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I sort of, I wonder how many of them are, are committed to just sort of making things work going forward, like how much they care about a budget or other things like that. Because, like, I feel like the Republican majority in like 2013 knew these things too. 
and yet still went ahead with a lot of this stuff. I but, mean, yeah. with Ted Cruz. Right, with Ted Cruz, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he's still there, but yeah. <laughs> um, this is, I think, going to be the big question going yeah. forward, because a lot of those more, more moderate Republicans have left Congress. I think you see, you're seeing more, you're seeing more Boberts, Marjorie Taylor Greene, sort of um, Jim Jordans than you are like a Fred Upton, right? Or an Adam Kinzinger. I would say Liz Cheney, very conservative lawmaker, very conservative. Like the fact that she's called a rhino, I think is, is still a little bit mind boggling to me because she is such a conservative lawmaker, but she also believes in sort of the foundations of government and she didn't want to, you know, placate Trump. And I think that's rare, um, but she's managed to, you know, work across the aisle. A lot of lawmakers do work across the aisle. I think for all media like me talk about, I can, I can criticize myself, talk about sort of the divisions within Congress. A lot of times, a lot of bills do, especially um, uh, a lot of bills do pass with like bipartisan support, especially the suspension bills. And these are bills like that Usually people it would be a voice vote because everyone's sort of in agreement, but sort of the Freedom Caucus has, has you know, tried to slow things down by forcing votes on that. And that's why you see like Lauren Boebert voting no on a bunch of things that like a lot of other Republicans have voted yes on. Um, a question for you about uh, polling. Um, it looked like overall the polls had a pretty good night that, you know, a lot of the a lot of the forecasts that were just based on polls predicted something like what was what happened. Um, they weren't wildly off. Like, we didn't see errors like we saw in, say, 2016 or 2020. It looked more like 2018, where the polls were pretty close to the outcome. I mean, was I'm curious if that's if that's your read. Did, were the polls mostly getting things right or were there some big misses? I mean, for Colorado, I mean. <laughs> Bennett, the polls for Bennett, you know, maybe high single digits, he's winning by double digits. And I, you know, I think most people, there were some that had this race, like a point, like one or two, they didn't show the tab. So there was always a doubt. And like real clear politics had moved this race into the toss up category. And when I saw that, oh yeah. When I saw that, I was like, I was trying to find like their reasoning behind it. And I couldn't because none of the polling indicated that this would be a toss up race. And Bennett ended up winning by his widest margin yet, yeah. again, in this atmosphere. So, you know, I, I joke in the newsroom that I hate polls. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like it's a little crutch. It's to stop us from actually like going out and talking to people. It's not the case. People yeah. always go out and talk to other voters. Um, but, you know, for me, every time I saw these polls, I, I kind of doubt myself and I just wonder, you know, again, is this right? Is this wrong? Because in the past, polls have been off. And sometimes you do see variations and you wonder, like, no, I don't think, I don't think there was much polling on the Bobert race. But, you know, Frisch put out some internal poll numbers where showed him within striking distance, but, but not, again, not this close. I think the interesting thing in that poll, and this is where I, I think you do get some fun and fun facts from polls was that he was doing much better with unaffiliated voters mm -hmm. and that Lauren Boebert had high unfavorable ratings, which tells you that, again, you know, maybe she's in a bit more trouble than, than you would expect. Um, I think there are things you can learn from polls. But I think, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think for this, this cycle, polls were more on target than, than in past. Um, but I'm not a pollster. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I won't hold you to that. But <laughs> I think I'm supposed to be making eye contact with uh, Dean Mayer at some point soon, but I can't really see him from where I'm sitting. So, oh, hi. Hi. Okay. <laughs> but I'll just um, ask one more question before we uh, take some uh, audience questions. Um, and just, again, polling related, but more about like exit polls. I'm actually curious um, what we've seen. So, like, compared to, say, 2018 midterms, this was obviously a somewhat more Republican electorate, but are we seeing interesting movements within the population. Um, are there some subgroups that are trending more Republican, trending more Democratic? Um, I've seen a, a fair amount of discussion about the Latino vote, and I don't have a great sense of uh, what the latest findings are there. So in, in two ways, this will actually be a short question. I haven't seen any of the exit okay. polling for 2022 yet, but you know, the Republicans really did make a push for the Latino vote. You know, I think there are a lot of issues where 
you know, the environment or not the environment, the economics uh, have been a really strong is issue. And then there's some social issues that could skew uh, more towards the Latino vote. I think this is one of those things that I will be looking at in the next couple of weeks and days, days and weeks to see how much movement there was. And, you know, the race that we haven't really talked about, the caraveo kirkmeyer race, um, the eighth congressional district, which is the new congressional district, has the largest Hispanic population of the any congressional district in the state. And Caraveo, who is a Latina, was you know making a strong play for that vote, as was Kirkmeyer, because it's such a strong block. And while no ethnic group is a monolith, you know, she was Caraveo was saying one of the things that she saw was excitement around her campaign, the idea that a she'd be the first Latina from Colorado to to be in Congress, and that like people in her district who were of Hispanic and Latino heritage were excited to see someone who looked like her or who looked like them rather running for Congress. And I, I think, again, this, this race is too close to call, but that's going to be an interesting demographic because on the other, on the flip side, usually Hispanics have had low voter turnout, at least historically. So if I think if we see a, an increase in that and a Caraveo win, I think it's a lot, I, I think, you know, it's part part and parcel. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I now have the honor of answering some or asking uh, some questions from the audience. Let's see. Um, let's see. While you have been speaking, oh, okay, we're getting a good update here. Okay, we have learned uh, that Georgia is going to a runoff, the Georgia Senate race. Um, any Again. predictions about that? Like, who is advantaged in a runoff that might not have been this time around? Or is there any way to know that? I think, uh, I don't, well, that's going to be a really good question. Um, I kind of wonder because the runoff will just be Warnock and um, Walker. Right now, there's a third party candidate, there's a libertarian candidate who I'm, you know, I'm assuming took votes from Herschel Walker. So it'll be interesting to see. But what, what we're all going to see, is lots and lots of money being put back into Georgia for like campaigning. You know, I feel really bad for Georgians and all the campaign ads that they are going to see and all the politicians that are going to be coming down again to stump for various candidates. But, I, you know, if this is a, you know, if this is the seat that can put Republicans to 51 or keep Democrats to 50, there's going to be a lot of money going into that race, a lot, even more than this race. Yeah. Um, so, so similarly, I kind of, well, I'm actually sort of wondering about this. Like, one of the things that probably helped Walker in this election was uh, Governor Kemp winning a pretty strong oh, reelection, and that won't be there next time around. I don't know. You could, you could game this out a few different ways. But yeah, this will be a big national race in one state. Um, again. With a ton of money. Again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Assuming a Republican controlled Congress. Um, does the outcome of these midterms, does it portend anything for 24? Does it tell us, do we, have we learned anything about um, what to expect in 2024 from this election? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I think what will be interesting to see is how 2020 affects both Biden and Trump. You know, if Republicans do get a large enough majority, does that, you know, make Biden think twice about running for a second term? If you know, if for some reason Democrats pull this out because of, you know, Trump's candidates, does he decide not to run? Like he's going to be some emeritus, you know, figure in the GOP. And I know I said earlier, I don't see that happening. And I still don't see that happening. But, you know, maybe someone convinces him. I don't know. Um, but I, I would say this. I think the one thing we, it shows that Trump is weaker than he might like to be. Again, I don't know that that translates to people sort of withdrawing their support from him, um, but I don't think he knocks people out of a pos I think he faces a primary if he decides to run. I, he doesn't knock people out of that race. Okay. Um, so, okay, this is an interesting question here about uh, basically democratic messaging surrounding some of their weaknesses. Okay, so they were going to an election where the economy was okay, but shaky, high inflation, um that uh and democrats could have made arguments about 
a lot of this is from COVID. This is a lot of this is what we're seeing in a lot of economies all over the world. They did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is this how much of this is a democratic messaging issue or can you really not message your way out of an economy? I mean, you can, right? Okay. It's the economy, stupid. That was a nice, great message that what yeah. Clinton said, right? Yeah. So you can message your way out of it, but I think inflation is just so tough. And when, you know, I, I think everyone here would agree when you're the one facing these higher costs, you're just going to blame whoever is, is in power. This was really, this was great for Republicans. I mean, they could hammer hammer Democrats on this. And, you know, when, as a republic, I mean, Democrats, I think, have always had somewhat of a messaging problem. And I think when you say, you know, it's a supply chain issue, it is, you know, increased demand because COVID was there, it's because of a war in Ukraine, it sort of sounds like excuses after a while, right? You know, it's easier to blame spending and government, because that has been something that people have been hammering away at for years. It's easy, it's pithy, Blame government. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any way of talking your way out of or a good messaging for inflation. I mean, Democrats have been talking about all the different reasons why we're facing inflation right now, and that it is a global problem, and that countries that spend a lot of money and countries that didn't are all facing the same inflation. Let me ask, raise of hands, how many how many people were how many of you were influenced by that message? Exactly. They might not know. <laughs> How many of you knew that message? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, you knew, but what, yeah, <laughs> messaging problem. Thank you. Interesting. Okay, uh, here I'll offer the 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 dumb political science retort, um, but which is actually similar to what you were arguing that like people are just going to blame who's in charge. Um, so there's this great thing I, I will work this into my classes sometimes. Um, uh, political scientist Larry Bartels found this finding a few years ago. So if you're familiar with the movie Jaws. Um, that was based on a series of real events that happened uh, in off the shore of New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore, in the summer of, 20, of 1916. Okay, there was actually a man-eating great white shark killed a number of people. The sheriff and a few people got a boat together and went on and killed the shark. Okay, that that all really happened. Um, and uh, but it like it in this one beach town, it like collapsed the economy because it, no one wanted to stay there anymore that summer. And, you know, it, like a lot of the hotels went out of business and things like that. Um, the vote for President Wilson that summer, who was running for re-election, um, was lower in New Jersey than it was relative to other places. And it was actually lower in, like, there was a massive turnout against President Wilson, essentially blaming him for the shark. Um, and we see things like this throughout history where like, you know, the volcano erupts and so people overthrow the emperor because someone's angry. You know, people just get mad at the person in charge, whether or not they're directly responsible for it, whether there's a, you know, there's a path. And Gray Davis and rolling blackouts. Yes. Which led to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, presidents have slightly more influence over the economy than Wilson does over, over a shark, but only slightly. Um, but, you know, people go with they, they want they need you need to blame someone and why not um uh another question here um we've seen very little of vice president harris um she did not seem to be heavily involved in this in the in the elections as far as i could tell um what was your she, impression on that? she was doing stuff okay like i i get the press releases she was out like in california and some other states I, it wasn't as high profile as biden but i could, i would also argue that biden wasn't out as much as you would expect you know hmm. an incumbent president to be. Granted, he's underwater. I'm not sure how many people would have wanted to campaign with him. It's always a big question. Um, but no, she was doing stuff. It just just wasn't a lot. And I, I, I will say this, you know, vice presidents don't. When she first started, there was a lot put on her and she was very sort of front and center. I think now she's sort of gone back to the traditional sort of vice president role of not being seen as much. And you can tell me if I'm wrong on that. But I feel like that's that's where she is now. I mean, that seems that is the traditional role to yeah because, and to just be largely invisible and you know people criticize you vaguely um but yeah <laughs> um yeah and actually that, that raises a good point about like biden's activity um you know they say midterms are a referendum on the president but which president right um, <laughs> i mean this I, I feel like this was just as much a referendum on trump as yeah. it was on biden yeah and he showed up i guess well he and obama did a couple of things they did an event in in philadelphia yeah with and, fetterman yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, and a few other races that maybe that helped um okay let's see um 
addressed that one. I've addressed that one. <laughs> okay. Um, well, this is sort of getting on a previous point, but let's see, with, with many people saying they won't concede, uh, particularly on the right, how big of a problem will this be going forward? That's a good question. Um, I, I will say last night I was at the Democratic Watch Party and I was one of the things I was struck by was the fact that Michael Bennett said that Joe Day had called to concede and they had a very nice conversation, you know, said they'd keep in touch. And even Joe Day mentioned that, like, you know, they had a good conversation. And I it struck me as how, like, it's only been a few years with how odd that is now that people do that. Right. Because that's yeah. that used to happen all the time. Um, but I think you saw a lot of that happening last night for mm -hmm. some of the races. I don't know. I think if we move back to sort of more of the traditional politics, I think we'll see that again. I think there'll always be someone who doesn't concede because for whatever reason they think it's close or or something. They just, you know, sometimes personalities, people just don't like each other and don't want to talk on the phone because mm -hmm. um, some of these campaigns can get pretty ugly. But I, I, I'd like to hope, this is me being an optimist, I'd like to hope that we will see more of that in the future again, because I think, I think right now we are a very polarized country. And if, if you're, you know, the people running for office can show some sort of grace and, and kindness towards one another, I'd like to think that it could, you know, <laughs> go out into the larger, larger world. Um, I don't know if you saw, I think it was Tim Ryan's concession speech in Ohio last night, where he made a point of saying, I am right now conceding because that is what we do in a democracy. Like, yeah, it was a really kind of digged, you know, concession speech, but, you know, ended it on a nice note. But <laughs> um, so we've talked about a few surprises in the state. I'm just, uh, you know, wondering more generally what surprised you yesterday or what is surprising you so far, like things that are standing out to you as interesting. I mean, obviously, it's the CD3 race and the CD8 race. I mean, the possibility that Colorado could send a, you know, have a congressional delegation that is six Democrats and two Republicans, I think is crazy, like, especially for a state that has had this blue reputation. I mean, like, for me, if that actually happens, Colorado is a blue state. Um, and especially when we were looking at potentially a 4-4 split delegation, right? You know, the, the idea with all the incumbents and that, um, that Kirk Meyer would win in eight. Um, so that is surprising me. I mean, we kind of knew sort of where the winds were blowing for the GOP in Colorado, but again, where the GOP is going, that is like the big question that I want to like sort of find out and, and know how it regroups from here. Um, so that's something we'll be watching. Let me think what else. Uh, how many ballot measures were also kind of close? Like the psilocybin? Mm -hmm. That was really close. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't think it'd be that close. I actually thought it'd go down. Is that, have we learned whether that passed yet or is it still too close to call? Yeah, I, I don't, I actually <laughs> did not bring my phone with me, so. But yeah, um, yeah, and actually one of the fun things is when you talk to voters, they actually talk about a lot of the ballot measures first before candidates. Like these really do sort of energize people and maybe because there's so many of them on the ballot. Yeah, we actually we had a very lively chat in class this morning about the the the, the liquor ballot measures, um, ah. particularly the one about liquor delivery with food that uh, I guess Grubhub and DoorDash were really supporting, and which seems to have gone down yeah. pretty resoundingly. Um, which I I don't know I don't know how many people saw that coming, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Oh, you've got more. Oh, you don't. Oh man, there's more. Some good addition. Okay. Great. <laughs> Um, um, hmm. Do you think a poor Republican showing than expected um, will lead to a more moderate Republican Party in 24? Is there is that a lesson that they pull from this? Hold on. National Congress or Colorado? We can go either. Can go All right. Uh, in the House? No. I don't think I don't yeah. think it becomes more moderate um, in Congress. I don't think it becomes more moderate. I think in Colorado, again, this is going to be the big question. I mean, are are conservatives going to be like this? Is what happens when you turn away from conservative values? People are going to vote elsewhere. Um, 
I mean, I'm going to be a pessimist and say I don't see that. I think it, I don't think it becomes more moderate. I think I think we see another cycle of it going far right before it it tilts back. But I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um. And I guess similarly, like what what should Democrats be taking this? Are, are they learning Are Democrats learning that they nominated the right sorts of people or do they need to be moving to the left or the right? Or is there not really much of a message here? I don't know that there's much of a message here for Democrats. Um, you know, you saw some good candidates go down again just because the mood is different. And part of it really is, you know, redistricting. There are some Colorado has like what? five really safe seats no six really safe yeah. seats and two one one toss-up and two maybe in a wave year go one way or the other right it's not really competitive um and i think that i don't know i kind of wonder what would happen if like colorado went with um like ranked choice like i feel like things like ranked choice voting or having to get 50 percent of the vote which is what you know, Georgia does, does for some moderation. I think that does it more than a poor showing, especially, you know, from a Republican in a plus seven Democratic district or a plus 13, you know, a state that went 13 and a half points for Biden. Um, yeah, or, you know, a Democrat who lost in a plus 20 Republican district. I don't, I don't think that that makes the party move to the center yeah. at all. Um, you mentioned this a little bit before. I'm curious, just overall, what, what do you see as the effect or the, um, the, the impact of unaffiliated voters in this election? I mean, are they the ones who are really making the call in, in Colorado or elsewhere? Um, or are they just overwhelmingly aligned with one party and just don't want to say that out loud? See, I feel like this is a question I would always ask you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, um, and I feel like this is how you would answer it. Yes, I think I think most unaffiliated voters are aligned with a party one way or or have leanings one way or, or the other. I think there is a small percentage that is like persuadable. And depending on how close a race that small percentage can be the the kingmaker. Um I don't think for example like when we when we see the CD3 race, it's going to be interesting to see how big the like how much of the unaffiliated voters broke for Frisch over Bobert. Um, and, and, and I do think it gives you an idea of um, of some of the leanings of the unaffiliated. Like I, I think most people tend to think of unaffiliated as being moderate, and that's not always the case, right? Sometimes they think they they go unaffiliated because they think the parties are just not extreme enough, not they're they're not too far to the right, they're not far enough to the right, they're not far enough to the left for them. Um, so yeah, but I do think unaffiliated voters make races interesting because I, as, as someone who goes around going, so let me ask, are you unaffiliated Democrat or Republican? I'm like, I'm always on the lookout for the unaffiliated voters to see how they're leaning because, you know, again, it's, it is, if you can find the persuadable ones and, and find out how they're, what they're thinking, it gives you an idea of what, how a race might go. Yeah, I'm actually sort of. I'm curious what your experiences with this are. I mean, like a lot of the state is unaffiliated now. It's it's the biggest party registration in the state. Um, when you talk to people and they say they're unaffiliated, can you use, can you pretty quickly get a sense of, okay, I'm really Republican. Okay, I'm really Democrat. Or, yes. Or, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mainly, <laughs> but mainly because of the questions you ask, right? Like, okay. so I'll ask the issues that are important to them. I'll ask, you know, I'll start asking a little bit about the candidates. And when you when they name like bunch of Democrats in a row or a bunch of Republicans in a row. I'm mean, like, so do you normally lean Republican? Do you normally lean Democrats? And people will, are usually, they'll, they'll usually say yes. But the other answer that I get a lot of is, but you know, I, I like to consider the, the candidate. Like I, I will consider a Republican or a Democrat. But then when you like drill down and find out it's been like 10 years since they voted for someone of the other party, I think it's a good indication that, you know, maybe not, you know, they do have some leanings, but you know, I, it's, the other thing I find kind of fun, the ticket skippers. This is a new, th people who don't vote for races, they'll leave races blank. Did anyone do that? Yeah, a couple, a couple <laughs> hands, yeah. You're not alone. There are a lot of people out there who just, you know, they don't like either candidate and instead of voting for them, we'll just be like, I'm gonna leave this one blank. And- Oh, well, and you get to like judges, and who knows? <laughs> I mean, it hasn't stopped people from voting before. I mean, so, you know, you see, you see like Polo's outperforming Bennett and some of it could be people who decided to split their ticket 
sometimes I just wonder how much of it is also ticket skippers that just don't vote. Because I did talk to a couple people who didn't. They were just like, I didn't like anybody, and I decided not to vote. Okay, fair. Um, I guess I'll go with a, a final question here is, you know, from your experiences in this cycle, um, what do you want to be doing? Are there things you'd want to be doing differently in covering future elections? Or what are you hoping to do in the future? Oh, God. That's a good question. Do you want to be sent to Georgia? No. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> God, no. <laughs> I want to recover from this race, and yeah. this race wasn't even that bad. Uh, Colorado, you know, I didn't, this, so I've been in Colorado for four weeks now, and I did some traveling, but I didn't do as much traveling um, for other parts of the states. Like, I've only gone to the Eastern Plains, like, twice, and I always feel like, I'm not getting that that Eastern Plains rural, which I think is very different from Western Slope rural. And, you know, if I had more time, I would want to travel and talk with more voters across the state, across the economic spectrum, across sort of the political spectrum. Um, I'd want to do that. But it's such that's also really hard because Colorado is such a large state. Like it takes four hours for I, I can do the drive from Denver to Grand Junction in just over four hours if I-70 is open, right? Yeah, big if. So, but that's like four hours where I'm just sort of sitting in a car not able to, because you can't, you're not supposed to text and drive, so I would never do that, <laughs> but you're not supposed to text or do any, like you can't do work and read emails. So it's just, it's a lot of time on the road getting someplace and maybe spending a few hours there trying to talk to voters. Um, and. And I do this a lot. You, you know, if you ever see me, I'm on a corner. Hi, my name's Caitlin Kim. I'm a reporter for Colorado Public Radio. Here, you know, trying to get your eye here. You know, the issues are important to you this election. You have a couple of minutes to spare. If a reporter ever does that to you, have a couple of minutes to spare, please. <laughs> um, that's my plea. That's, that's, if I can make you guys talk to a reporter and share your political views, I, I will have accomplished something. That's, that's so well done. That was, I mean, you're reminding me that there was a bit of a scandal with uh, Bobert last year that she was possibly overbilling for mileage driving around her district. And like in her defense, it's a big district. I mean, that's really big district. It's half the state and it's um, an enormous state. But yeah. My colleague, yeah. Andrew, and I, we tried to like we found as many of the public events that she could. And like it, it was actually quite doable. And Frisch says he's put 25,000 miles uh, traveling that district. I think I put like 10,000 one time I did this entire when it was the old CD. Mm -hmm. to like Steamboat Craig all the way down to Durango, like Alamosa, Pueblo, and back up. I, a lot of miles, a lot of miles in the car, yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, I want to be respectful of your time and that of our audience. Um, so this is at an end. We're going to stick around for a few minutes, but thank you all for joining us today. And um, thank you, Caitlin Kim. Please join me in uh, thanking Caitlin Kim for her time. Thank you, and uh, I prefer when I get to ask you questions. So we could do that the next time. <laughs>